rotational motion now. That means something is moving in a circle. That means in a certain time it will make an angle. As you see there, you see that the angle is theta. As the object moves from A to B, we've done this before. So the object goes from A to B, and obviously it's going in the counterclockwise direction, right? Counterclockwise is taken as positive in physics. So it's going in the counterclockwise direction. It goes from A to B. The angular displacement is theta, and let's say it took T seconds to do that. So remember that angle has to be in radians. And I'm trying to show you how to change radians into degrees. Most of you know. And the angle itself is defined as length of the arc divided by the radius. That's the definition of angle in radians. So according to that definition, theta would be AB divided by the radius. So there I'm just giving you the definition of angle in radians, just length by length. So technically it has no dimension, correct? Because it's length divided by a length, it has no dimension. 360 degrees is how many radians? 2 pi? Okay. 30 degrees? What do you do? Into 2 pi by 360. So you get it as pi by 6. 45 degrees. Do the same thing. 45 times 2 pi by 360. So to change degrees into radians, that's what you do. You multiply by 2 pi. Divide by 360. Multiply by 2 pi, divide by 360. And the reason is 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees. Correct? In fact, you could multiply by pi and divide by 180. It's the same thing. So that's the idea there. So I've just defined angle and told you how to change radians into degrees or degrees into radians both ways. They call it angular velocity. What's the symbol for angular velocity? Okay, you call it W, but it's omega. It's omega. Omega is theta over t. We have done this. And it's defined as the angle described in one second. The angle described in one second. So this is just a review. Once again, the same diagram. Omega would be theta over t. And the unit would definitely be radians per second, isn't it? Because angle is in radians and time is in seconds. It's written this way, rad per second. So that's the second definition, angular velocity, theta over t. And then we also know that if an object makes f rotations in one second, what is that f called? The number of rotations made in a second is called? Frequency. The number of rotations made in a second is frequency. called frequency. It is the frequency. It's, in fact, it's the linear frequency. If f rotations are made in one second, we know the relation is omega is 2 pi f. So that's the relation between angular velocity which is also called angular frequency. Remember that. This could also be called angular frequency. That's linear frequency. So angular linear. That's the relation between the two. And frequency is 1 over time period, isn't it? We have used that many times. What about angular acceleration? What do you mean by angular acceleration? See, there is a point here where you could get confused. So you have to be listening up. And think about this. If you have an object moving in a circle with a constant velocity, constant velocity, is it accelerating? Does it have any kind of acceleration is my question. It's moving with a constant velocity, you know, as uniform as possible, not increasing, not decreasing. My question is, is does it have any kind of acceleration? Yes, it does. What's that called? Centripetal acceleration. And that is towards the center. But now I'm going to ask you this. What if I keep on increasing the speed? You know, I start slowly and then keep increasing it. Now you have another acceleration. 
That is called the angular acceleration. It's also called the tangential acceleration. Do you see the difference? So the centripetal acceleration is always there. Whether you speed it up or, you know, whether you go at a constant rate, you always have the centripetal. But if you speed it up, you start slow, speed it up, in addition to the centripetal acceleration, you also have a tangential acceleration. Why is it called tangential? Because the other one is along the radius. It could be called radial. So this is tangential. So you're going to see the difference. Don't mix up. Get mixed up between these two, please. Angular acceleration, the symbol is alpha. And obviously, just like you define acceleration, you, you remember how we define acceleration? Isn't it change in velocity over time? Same thing, but here it is change in angular velocity over time. Change in angular velocity over time. Therefore, the unit should be radians per second squared, just like meter per second squared. You see the similarity between the two? So alpha replaces A in linear motion. We are always going to com compare linear motion with uh, angular motion or rotational motion. So I'm going to already start the comparison. Linear, rotational. What we used to say called delta x in linear motion has now become theta or delta theta. Time is time. No change. What we called velocity has now become angular velocity. Do you see that? What we used to call as linear acceleration is now replaced with angular acceleration. And that's a perfect match. See the units, everything agrees. So this comparison is going to continue until the end of the chapter. That's why it's supposed to be easy, because you've already seen it. Well. I called it translatory motion, which is the same as linear motion and rotational motion. I'm trying to give that comparison as a chart there. I call it lost is d by t. You may call it x by t. Omega is theta by t. Units, meter per second. Here it's radians per second. All right. We have this formula, don't we? You remember this formula? What's that? Initial. Initial velocity. So, can you write the similar, the corresponding formula in angular, I mean, rotational motion? How would the formula look like? Because we need not derive it. It's going to look like this. Omega naught plus alpha t. Because A is replaced by alpha. You see the similarity? All right, give you some more chances. This is what we used to call the king. And I want you to try to write the corresponding equation. Don't say it, just write it. You should have got it, right? Delta theta, omega naught t plus one half alpha t squared. Okay, the other one. We had one like this. Definitely it's going to be omega squared is omega naught squared plus 2 alpha delta theta. So those are the main equations, although we could have written another, another one. It would be good for you to write it. I just did not remember to write that. There is an equation like this, quite useful. Delta x is b naught plus 2. Does anybody remember this? Average velocity multiplied by time. What would be the corresponding one? Delta theta. Similarity. Notice. Just multiply with the radius. That's what I'm trying to bring out here. I'm trying to derive that. Although we did that at the beginning of the other chapter, I'm trying to do that again. You need not take down the derivation as such. You know, that's how you get the relation. Velocities are omega. Okay, linear velocity is radius times angular velocity. Then I did talk about tangential acceleration, didn't I? That's alpha. I'm going to talk about that again. 
a tan dv by dt uh, see I don't know maybe look there is a difference maybe I'm using I'm using it what's alpha what is alpha called uh -uh. what is alpha called angular acceleration I think somebody said tangential and I jumped to it that's why you should not say anything in between Alpha is called angular acceleration. It is not tangential acceleration. Is that clear enough? Alpha is angular acceleration. We are trying to find tangential acceleration now. So take a look at that carefully. Tangential acceleration should be, by definition, dv by dt, isn't it? But what's velocity? Isn't it omega r? Well, I'm using caps r, isn't it? And which is a constant there? Omega and R. Radius is constant. So t that's taken out. So what will you have? Radius times d omega by dt. And what's d omega by dt? Alpha. Okay. So now you got the relation. So that's the relation between A tan and R alpha. I've written it here, but I just wanted you to be very clear that this is what is called tangential acceleration. And this is angular. Is this clear enough? All right, omega, I mean, alpha is angular acceleration, A is tangential acceleration. We got the relation between them. Well, we do know radial acceleration before. Radial acceleration, we know that. I'm just writing it as AR. We know it's V squared over R, isn't it? That's why centripetal force is MV squared over R. But it can also be written like this. All right, now that diagram clearly shows you the two. It shows you that the direction of tangential acceleration definitely is along the tangent. That's why it's given that name. And radial acceleration is along the radius towards the center. They're always going to be at 90 degrees. The right hand rule, you're going to use the right hand rule several times in physics. Let me tell you what it is. If something is rotating, watch this. If something is rotating this way, oh no, let me just, for you, is this clockwise or counterclockwise? For you. For you, it's counterclockwise. You better know <laughs> which is which, okay? That's counterclockwise for you. So let's imagine something is rotating that way. Its angular velocity is given by your thumb. <coughs> if the rotation is represented by your closed fingers, you see, towards the tips, then the direction of the angular velocity is given by your thumb. That's why it's called the right-hand rule. Is that clear enough? So that means if the object is rotating in the opposite direction, you would have to hold your hand that way because it's rotating that way. And you see that the angular velocity is into the plane of the board. That is what you mean by the right hand rule. I'm sure everybody knows which the right hand is. Because if you use the left hand, it's exactly opposite. So that's the right hand rule. So everything explained. It gives you the direction of the angular velocity, gives you the direction of omega. And the red and the green. I don't know, the two greens are not exactly the same, but I think you can make out. Yeah, actually, there is. Yeah, I've seen a lab, where the a bicycle away. wheel. Yeah, we'll do it in the lab, and it's yeah. tremendous. It is tremendous. You will see what happens because when you change direction, you see angular velocity just became opposite, right, in direction. And we'll do it in the lab, and you will experience it. So that's the direction of angular velocity. So it says, hmm. Another thing, what if it's speeding up? Not over yet. What if it is rotating in this direction and speeding up? Does it have an angular acceleration? If it's speeding up? Yes. yes. What's the direction of that angular acceleration? The same. Okay. The same as that of angular velocity. But if it's slowing down, it's opposite. Hello. Hold on. So you have something rotating this way, first very fast and then slowing down, right? Let's do this together. What's the direction of the angular velocity towards you? 
But since it's slowing down, what's the direction of its angular acceleration? That way. Because it is slowing down. Same thing in linear velocity. If you're slowing down as you go to the east, isn't it your acceleration towards the west? Yeah. Because you're slowing down. Same thing. Don't make it too tough. Because it's not. That's why I said if speeding up, alpha has the same direction as omega. If slowing down, alpha has the opposite direction as omega. So remember it that way. Speeding up, omega and alpha have the same direction. Slowing down, they have opposite directions. It's going to be useful when you work out problems. Okay. Torque. How do you define it? Simple thing. If I have to open this door, and I'll take one minute to explain this. I have to apply a force, right? Is this object rotating? Yeah. Yes. You see the axis of rotation is at the hinges. Mm -hmm. And if the force that I've applied is 10 newtons here, isn't this the perpendicular distance between the axis of rotation and the force? Yes. See how I'm applying the force? Straight. I'm not applying the force this way. You see what I'm trying to say? I'm applying it at right angles to the door. So that's the line of action of the force. Are you with me? Line of action of the force. And therefore, this is the perpendicular distance. And if you multiply the two, you will get the torque. That's it. But what do you have to multiply? Some people have learned it this way. Some people say, torque is just the product of force and distance. No, it's not. It's the product of... Tell me, come on, tell me. Product of... The force and the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the point. That's what I'm trying to show here again. So let's watch this. Second time. So you can see that I applied the force, F, and that the force can be broken up into the perpendicular and the parallel components. Right? You see that there? And tau is rf sine theta, so rf perpendicular, which is rf sine theta, which can be written as r cross f. Great equation, very important formula. Is tau a scalar or a vector? It's a vector, you can see that. Because whenever you take a cross product of two vectors, you always get another vector. But if you take the dot product, you get a scalar. Okay, that's the difference. And what, another thing, is R cross F the same as F cross R? Is R cross F the same as F cross R? It's not. Because One is the right? negative of the other. So whenever you write this, it should always be R cross F. Don't say, oh, well, it's not multiplication. So you can't say F cross R. It's R cross F. And therefore, the unit of torque, give me the proper unit of torque. Put their units together. I would put it as meter newton. I don't care. Point. Okay, I said the unit is meter newton. And let's go on. Now, this is an important part of this chapter. A sudden change, you know, a big step forward. I'm trying to get the relation between torque and rotational inertia. But before that, I have to ask you something. You know, this is, have you heard about inertia? Make my life easier. Yes. Okay. What does inertia depend on? See, if you, if you give me the answer quick. Yeah, say that, say that. Mass. mass. Good. That's why I asked you once upon a time this question, if a fat man and a thin man are standing on a moving bus. You remember that question? And the bus is suddenly stopped. Who has a greater fall? And you said the fat one because he has a greater mass. He has a greater linear inertia. What inertia are we talking about there? Linear inertia. Because we're only talking about But now we're talking about rotating bodies, isn't it? 
So you've got to bring in rotational inertia. And I'm going to, we're going to look at what rotational inertia depends on. Okay, on one side. Linear inertia depends on what? Mass. Now what are we trying to see? We're trying to see what rotational inertia depends on. And at the outset, I'm going to tell you, rotational inertia depends on mass and the distribution of the mass about the axis. I'm going to prove it. Rotational inertia also depends on what? On the, the mass, but also on how the mass is distributed about the axis. Here, to give it higher rotational inertia. So let's get the math in it quickly. All right, I'm considering a small particle of mass m, uh, well, alpha increases with tau, you know that. We're trying to bring in this relation, which is so important, Newton's second law, right? Net force is mass times acceleration, and all I have done is substituted for A. Don't we know that A is R alpha? Don't make this complicated. Don't we know that? Yes. Okay. Now, what is tau? How is tau defined? Isn't tau force times the perpendicular, you know, distance? So I'm going to do that. So that brings in mr alpha times another r, see? Right. So wouldn't that make it mr squared alpha? mr squared alpha. And mr squared is called the rotational inertia. Mass times square is called the rotational inertia. That's what I'm trying to say. For a rigid object with n particles, which I'm trying to show, like a disk, because there are millions of particles, you can take the summation on both sides. Take the summation on both sides. So you take the summation here, sigma tau, you do the same here. Leave with me. So don't you have to take the sum of 1 to n particles? What are the constants here? For each particle, alpha is going to be constant. Okay? So alpha is taken out. You get sigma mr squared. That's called I. I is sigma mr squared. I had to write it that way to show you that that's very important. And I is called the rotational inertia. I is called the rotational inertia. Okay, I felt that was not neat enough, so I wrote it again. So, this was the comparison I gave you. Net force is mass times acceleration. Net torque is I alpha. So I'm saying that rotational inertia, I, replaces mass. And that is the equivalent of Newton's second law. Well, it's also called moment of inertia. Okay, rotational inertia or moment of inertia. The unit, kilogram meter squared. Where did I get that from? Because I is sigma mr squared. You remember that? Okay, so the unit of rotational inertia is kilogram meter squared. And I depends on the axis of rotation, where the axis is. In fact, I depends on three quantities, even though I've not written it. Rotational inertia depends on the total mass. Doesn't it depend on the total mass? Yes. It depends on where the axis of rotation is. It depends on the distribution of the mass. In fact, it also depends on the inclination of the axis. You know what I mean by inclination of the axis? Most of the time, the axis will be at right angles to the surface, right? But what if the axis is not at right angles? Would it have the same rotational inertia? No. So I gave you four factors. Rotational inertia depends on, number one, the total mass, the distribution of the mass about the axis, depends on the position of the axis, depends on the inclination of the axis. Four quantities. And we need not derive all this, but it would be good if you knew some of these. Regular shaped objects, let us take a look at it. We could use calculus and derive, and I'm going to use calculus just to show you how powerful calculus is to derive one of these equations. But you at least need to know what they are. Hoop. See, it always gives the axis, see, about a central axis. What's the rotational inertia? mr squared. 
if it's a cylinder an annular cylinder which means it has an inner radius and an external radius okay then the formula is one half mass r1 squared plus r2 squared what if it's a solid cylinder one half ml squared what's the l is the length m is the total mass are you getting what i'm saying look at the hoop here the same hoop but do you notice that the axis has changed come on so now do you see that in this case the rotational inertia is still the same but that will not be the same for every case unfortunately i don't have a, another figure to demonstrate that okay but look at this and this what's the difference between these two spheres one is solid the other is hollow which one has a higher moment of inertia solid or hollow be careful hollow definitely didn't i tell you that if the mass is what do you mean by hollow sphere more masses away from the axis come on now right so if you are asked to do calculations about the earth wouldn't you regard that as a solid sphere the earth almost and we can even find out what would happen if the earth speeds up in its rotation we'll do all that so these are some of the formulas that you need to know i found a better one so try to write down a few of this although i might give it to you it's good to know solid sphere 2 by 5 mr squared solid sphere just write that whatever i'm telling you the most important one is this disk you can either call it a solid cylinder or a disk it's 1 half mr squared 1 half mr squared that's the most important one solid sphere disk hoop is just mr squared and this one that's a long thin rod about an axis through the center it is 1 by 12 ml squared is it related to uh this can last here i shall metal or calculus one we're getting there in a minute uh. and this is the axis about one end okay look at these two isn't it the same object come on the axis when it's at the center what's the rotational inertia 1 by 12 but if it's rotating about one end do you notice that this is four times bigger than the other one yeah. this is four times bigger <laughs> than this do you notice that come on yes it is so when would an object have the lowest rotational inertia about which axis about an axis passing through its center any object will have the lowest rotational inertia about an axis passing through its center of mass now we know center of mass right and the axis should be at right angles to the surface think about the tires of a car isn't that how it is the axle connecting the two isn't it right through the center and at right angles to it because that's the lowest that's how they do it there are other technical problems if you don't do it that way which you can very well imagine you know okay now we are trying to use a little bit of calculus to find the rotational inertia of a disk and that will be the last part of this chapter to find the rotational inertia of the disk and if you enjoy math and calculus you're going to enjoy it even more what are we trying to do find the formula for rotational inertia of a disk how is the axis through the center and at right angles what you have to do first is you have to imagine that the disk is divided into small circular sections right and you can already see a small circular section that i have considered so the entire disk is divided into small circular shells let me call it and so the radius of those shells will change from a lower limit zero to an upper limit equal to the radius of the disk try to enjoy it. try to enjoy it because otherwise math has no sense unless used in physics the smallest shell has a radius zero isn't it i'll be just touching the axis that's the lower limit that's what you mean by lower limit 
And then the highest limit would be what? The radius of the disk. Right? So now what we're going to do is, is this mass constantly distributed, I mean uniformly distributed on the disk everywhere? Is it uniform? On the disk? Yes, it is uniformly distributed. So we'll find the mass per unit area. How? Do you know how to find the mass of that disk? I mean the area of the disk? What's the formula for area of the disk? What's the, what's the area of the disk? Pi r squared. And so since its mass is distributed over that entire area, I'm going to define a new quantity, which you're going to see. M is the total mass. R is the radius. Therefore, the area is pi r squared. And so the mass per area would be simply m divided by pi r squared. Isn't that the mass of unit area? That means mass of one meter squared. There's so much understanding that has to go in here. That's the mass of one meter squared. Mass per unit area, isn't it? No movement. Now, you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to find the area of that shell. Come on. Mm -hmm. Who can tell me what's the area of that shell? Go ahead. Okay. Just that area of that thin shell. You know what's R the area of that? R2 minus 101. Well, pi, that's what you meant. Pi R2 squared minus R1, R1 squared. squared. Yeah. yeah, pi times external radius squared minus internal radius squared. But we need not do that because it's such a thin shell. You could make an approximation. This is what you do. If you imagine that the shell is cut somewhere, just cut out and you open it out, what will you have? What will that, what will that look like if you cut it and stretch it? it? What will it look like? It will look like a rectangle. What is the length of that rectangle? The circumference. And what will be the, the breadth, the width, dx? Oh, you see, in math, when you bring in the dx, you don't even know what it is. You don't even know it's dx, it's dy. Now I'm trying to tell you, hold on, listen. Now I'm trying to tell you this. Don't get too excited. I'm trying to tell you that if that's the shell, I'm going to take the radius as x. And dx is the change in x which is the thickness. You see that? That's why we call it dx. So what's the area of that finally? If it's a rectangle, what's the area of that? 2 pi x dx. How many got it? The circumference is 2 pi x. <laughs> and the width is dx, isn't it? So that is the... I mean, I don't derive this in every semester, I don't. But today I said, let me. Okay, so that's the area of that. So what's the mass of that? Just the mass of that shell. Didn't we get the mass? Didn't we get the mass of one meter square? So what do you have to do to get the mass of this? Multiply. So you got to go m by pi r squared times because this is the mass of one meter square, and this is the area of that shell. So if you do that, aren't you getting the mass of that? Mass of what? The shell. the shell. Now, the last step. Don't write. I'll give you time to write. It's about understanding. OK. Who can tell me the formula for rotational inertia of that shell? Now, the shell is so thin that you can imagine it's a particle. Right? If it's a particle, what's the general equation for rotational inertia of a particle? Mass times distance squared, isn't it? OK. So what would be the rotational inertia of that? Its mass. What's its mass? What's its mass? Isn't it m or oh, 2m by help me out r squared x dx? Is that the mass? Times its distance squared. What's its radius squared? What's its radius? X. Okay. M R squared. Could you see it? Mass times its radius squared. What is that? What's on the left hand side? <laughs> the rotational inertia. You're going to be engineers. You're going to have a lot of derivations like this. 
You're not, getting, you're not going to get the engineering degree without tremendous amount of deriving stuff like this. You're not. Nobody's going to come up, stand in front of you and say, you know what, this is the equation, take it down. That stopped in high school when you didn't have to know the reason. Now you have to know the reason behind everything. This is just a taste of that. OK, what do you get now? What is this? 2m by r squared x cubed dx. What is that on the left-hand side? That's the rotational inertia of just that shell. OK, now we are ready to find the rotational inertia of the whole disk by integrating. From limits, what's the variable here? x. Lower limit, 0. To upper limit, x is equal to the radius. The calculus part is easy, because you have crammed it. You take the constants out, right? Take the constants out, x cubed dx is x raised to 4 by 4. Everybody knows that. Put the limits, you will get the formula. What a sweet thing for the application of calculus in physics. Let's finish it. So area of the section, 2 pi x dx. This could be a 10-point question on your exam. Be careful, because I've taken 15 minutes. So mass of the section. The pi's are cancelled, and then the moment of inertia is mass times radius squared. So I write the entire mass down. Its radius is x squared. I'm doing the same thing again. Constants taken out. To find the total, you integrate. When you integrate, you get x raised to 4 by 4. And I've already substituted the upper limit because the lower limit is 0, right? Why waste time? And that gives you 1 half mr squared. That's the most important formula, the moment of inertia of a disk. Now I'll challenge you. I'll give you five minutes. I'll give you extra credit, a lot of extra credit. Use calculus and find the rotational inertia of a solid sphere. I'll give you five minutes. If you don't do it, it's okay. You don't lose anything. But if you do it, you get a lot of extra credit. Use the same process, and you really have to be, you know, thinking. Find the rotational inertia of a solid sphere. 